no big formal introduction. I think probably most of you know Stephen. Um, your official title is, lec are you senior lecturer now? Lecturer, lecturer in history. Um, and is also director of the Newman Studies Project, uh, which has quite a diverse set of people on the board or yeah, we're, we're membership in the, in the community, yeah. exactly, which I'm also a part of, which is very nice. Um, and you've written a book on Newman. Yes. Um, and he's one of your main research interests. Yes. Not your only one, but certainly you qualify as a new, new mania expert. Um, and we're very lucky to have him here for our second speaker in the Newman series. And today he's going to be, oh, the title's changed. Sorry. Slightly. Slight change. Please. Sorry. I wanted my rebel in there. A sympathetic realist. John Henry Newman and Irish nationalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me without, without the microphone? Is that okay? Can you all hear me? Great. Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to thank um, the organisers of Heather and also particularly Professor Newport. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Philip. Right. Just to make sure then, can everyone hear me through the microphone? Yeah. Um, So I'll start that again just so Philip can record me. I'd just like to thank um, particularly Heather for organising the event today and also Professor Newport for coming along. The subject of my paper is quite um, specific. Uh, it looks at Newman and his views towards Irish nationalism, which not a lot of people would be probably familiar with that particular subject. So today I hope to just bring you through a kind of evolutionary nature of Newman's views towards Irish nationalism and also his wider views on politics in general. Um, but before I, I touch upon that, I thought it would be important just to raise the profile of the, Newman's, uh, the John Henry Newman Research Projects, which the community within Hope are trying over the last number of months and indeed the last couple of years to promote. So there's a website I'd like to just draw people's attention to before I get underway. So we have in the last six months um, put together a, effectively a John Henry Newman Studies Project and within that website it's a base for disseminating uh, our interests and our, our knowledge uh, in relation to, to, to the blessed John Henry Newman and it's broken down into several categories as you can see, research, the man, his legacy, microfilm and the various links which we're trying to establish and nurture um, currently at, at this moment in time. But I, I just might, might like to mention in particular the microfilm collection. So when I first arrived at Hope in Octo October of two years ago, with the support of Professor Newport, the idea was that I would help to rebuild and re-energise Newman Studies at Hope. So um, I was allocated sufficient, num uh, sufficient monies to purchase Newman-related publications and to update the collection. So within in the last two years, I have done that. Um, the library now has an extensive collection of Newman's own works and indeed associated Newman works. And I'm quite proud of that. Uh, I think we're quite distinctive, particularly in this region. In, in addition to that, uh, last year we were quite lucky to purchase a microfilm collection of Newman's own personal papers. Um, and it's actually quite interesting, but through my own research, I became aware that the community of Newman scholars throughout the world weren't particularly aware of the Newman microfilm collection. It was put together in 1955 by R. Dwight Culler, the great Newman scholar. Um, but in many respects, it, kind of, it was forgotten about. But it's, it is, as far as I can ascertain, the complete collection of Newman's personal papers um, in a comprehensive format. So we now have that collection. It's available to consult in, in, the, uh, in the special collections. There's also an accompanying uh, catalogue, which I have a copy here, and I might just pass around to draw people, people's attention to. Um, but what's quite interesting is, only recently I've, I've finished an article for the, for, the, for the Catholic Archives in which I've established that, except for several prominent Newman scholars, the community at large in relation to Newman studies haven't utilised this resource, um, which is quite, it's quite strange in many respects, but I think there was an, has been an over-reliance on Newman's published works and the Letters and Diary series. But unfortunately, the Letters and Diary series only give the letters that were sent to Newman and not really the correspondence which he maintains and his own replies, but the microfilm collection does, and it's, it's, an, it's an excellent resource. I know actually Lucy, one of the undergraduate students, is writing her dissertation at the moment, uh, and she's looking and trying to utilise some of those materials. So I'd just like to make, make people aware that there is this great resource out there. On top of that, I suppose you should mention, at, at, at the moment there is a digitalisation project taking place. Uh, the National Institute for Newman Studies are now attempting, and um, God bless them, to digitalise the entire collection of Newman's personal papers, and that's in conjunction with the um, Manchester Library. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking. There's been several hundreds of thousands of pounds being invested in the project, and 
Um, more, material, more information can be found, found on the Institute for Newman Studies, uh, which is in Pittsburgh. But again, it, it, Newman Studies is not uh, static. It's always developing and, and emerging. And there's new trends of research that will hopefully stem from the fact that these papers will become more widely available. Um, so let me get down to my own paper today after plugging uh, the Newman uh, microfilm and indeed the, the digital papers. Basically, I wish today to talk about Newman's views towards Ireland. Now, this won't form my chapter in the book, which we hope to publish out of this. That chapter will deal with Newman and uh, papal infallibility, but I'm just working on it at the moment, and I didn't think it was ready for, for, uh, for um, public discourse. So I've chosen to select a topic which I've previously written about on Newman and, and as I said, Irish nationalism. Um, the work stems from a postdoctoral fellowship which I held from the Irish government, which um, employed me to examine Newman's Dublin writings from his own letters and diaries. So I was very fortunate that I was given an opportunity to visit the Birmingham Oratory where Newman's papers are currently kept and I had access, exclusive access to Newman's Dublin writings. It's a box of you know, terrific amount of memoranda and letters and it was from these writings and indeed with the published letters and diaries and the available uh, secondary sources that I put together a, a kind of challenge to the historiography about Newman and Irish nationalism, um, which in many respects had been a neglected subject, and those who had written about the subject hadn't really understood uh, Newman's views, uh, and it was from there that I, I kind of developed my own writings on Newman's political thought. So the book which I published, Newman, the, A Conservative at Heart, uh, The Political and Social Thought of John Henry Newman, stemmed from today's paper. Um, through my understanding of Newman's views in Ireland, I, I wanted to understand Newman's views and politics in general. So, I'll just put up the PowerPoint. There's three parts of the paper that I want to explore today. Um, so it's thematic, or sorry, chronological approach. The first part looks at Newman's relationship with um, Daniel O'Connell and Catholic emancipation. So we're talking here about 1829, uh, 1830. Then we turn to Newman's period in Ireland when he was rector of the Catholic University in Dublin from 1851 to 1858. And then we finish with Newman's period um, when he left Ireland from 1858 until he passed away in 1890. And the, the theme I, I wish to articulate today is there's, a, there's almost an evolution to Newman's views towards Ireland and Irish nationalism throughout his lifetime. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's a transition which is torturous, which is, is, is difficult for Newman, but it's something which is fulfilled in his later life where I argue, which is subtitled to today's paper, is that he becomes a, um, um, a, sympathetic, a sympathetic realist and has sympathies for Irish nationalism. And that's quite different to what he would have espoused uh, during his Anglican days of the 1830s and 40s. Now, before we start, before we get into the Newman and Irish nationalism, I think it's important that we understand Newman's political views as a collective. So I, I put this slide up first of all. Now, Probably one of the last slides you expected to see today was a picture of David Cameron and Nigel Clegg. But the, the concept I'm trying to arouse here is, was Newman a Tory, or indeed was Newman a Whig or a Liberal? Um, in no way am I trying to associate Newman with the political views of today. Of course, he's a, he's a man who's died over 100 years ago. Uh, so probably more relevant is to look at Newman's relationship with Gladstone and Israeli. Now, you might, might be quite surprised, but Newman maintained a healthy correspondence, particularly with Gladstone, throughout his life. Again, if you look at Newman's papers, the microfilm collections in, in the um, special collections, there's several letters between himself and Gladstone from the 1830s up until the 1880s. Um, so he did, as I say, maintain a healthy correspondence with Gladstone. And Gladstone, in many respects, took, took Glad, uh, Newman's views uh, on board, and act, he acted as an advisor, particularly in relation to Ireland. And that's where the paper will conclude today. Um, so. Was Newman a Tory or was he a, or was he a, a Whig? Um, can he be described as a Tory, a supporter of, of the Conservative Party, or indeed the Whig, a follower of the Liberal Party? So that's the question my book poses. Uh, could he be easily identified as belonging to a school of political conservatism whose principles rested firmly on respecting property rights, in upholding the distribution of wealth and privilege, in opposing revolution as a means of reconstruction society, and in protecting the dominant political role for an educated and proprietorized minority? Or indeed, was he a disciple of political liberalism, first defined as Whiggism, and later under the guise of the Liberal Party? This political foe demanded constitutional liberty, parliamentary reform, 
and to clip the wings of the crown and the church? So that's the question. That's the, 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 the question I've, I've posed myself during my research. Well, today I wish to vehemently argue he belonged to neither camp. He was neither a Tory or indeed a Whig. Newman was arguably a conservative at heart, but the conservatism which Newman espoused was through his theological views. He remained detached from the melting pot of the political crucible. He was no politician, nor did he ever claim to be. Politicians, Newman himself wrote in 1850, were essentially self-obsessed. They sought to uphold government, quote, not because it's good or desirable, but because he himself is well off consequence of it, and because to take care of number one, it is his main political principle. So he saw politicians as self-obsessed, and again, that would have went against everything Newman believed in. Um, so the point I wish to articulate is Newman saw himself first and foremost as a priest who remained detached from the melting pot of the, of the, political, of the political forum. However, this should, not suggest, this should not suggest that Newman didn't enjoy politics. Um, again, if you read Newman's works, if you read his private papers, his correspondence, he clearly enjoyed political discourse. Um, just for example, um, he routinely corresponded with many contemporaries, I've mentioned Gladstone, on an array of topics. He showed a keen interest in English general elections and parliamentary procedures. He showed a keen interest in wishing to find peace at the height of the Franco-Prussian War. And he also spoke of his disgust for the American Yankees over the Al Alabama crisis of the, eight, of the 1870s. So therefore, I wish to kind of articulate that behind the bravado, behind, behind the misconceptions uh, which has been articulated in the historiography, Newman was interested in politics. But of course, it always came second to his theological views and his stance in the world. So let me now bring us forward to looking at a, almost a case study of Newman's views towards Irish nationalism, because I think this is a good indication of how Newman's views evolved over the course of his lifetime. Newman was a rational man. He took facts, he digested them, and he came to, an, he came to a conclusion. Um, he wasn't a bigot, uh, and he was willing to change uh, his viewpoints based on conditions. So the first section looks at the genesis of Newman's views to, towards Ireland, uh, and that's focused through Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator the Irish emancipator, as he was referred to. Um, I suppose within that context, Newman's writings and Newman's stance in relation to Ireland has been overshadowed because of his role as, a, as the rector at the Catholic University and his seminal writings, uh, particularly the idea of a university. So many scholars, particularly Irish scholars, have felt it not necessary to look at Newman's views. And that's one of the areas where, which I seek to readdress, and hence my, view, my writings on Newman and Daniel O'Connell. Um, now, Newman's opposition, initially at least, to Irish nationalism was, was aroused indirectly by his vehement opposition to the passing of Catholic, Catholic emancipation by the House of Commons in March of 1829. So Newman firmly opposed his passing of the legislation. Uh, privately, again, reading his, his letters and in entries uh, from the period, he described the Tories' government's decision to introduce the Act as, quote, incalculable mischief. The Act permitted the seating of Roman Catholics in Westminster Parliament, and ensured that the Catholic middle class could have careers in the higher civil service and judiciary, although Catholics were still exempt from holding some office, such as of the Lord Chancellorship. Now, Newman opposed Catholic emancipation, not because he opposed Catholic claims or the demands for civic rights, but due to his fears that the Act might lead to further attacks on the Anglican Church and arose an erosion of the political status quo at Westminster. So he saw the Catholic emancipation as undermining the, the Anglican Church, particularly in Ireland, and this is why he opposed it. Now, this is in the context, Newman didn't convert to Roman Catholicism until 1845, so he's firmly within the Anglican camp at this time. Um, in response to this very public attack on, on his beloved church, Newman helped to found the Oxford movement, um, an extremely important movement of the 1830s and the early 1840s. And it was first conceived in 1833, and it was much concerned with politics as it was with religion. Now, lots of people might argue against me when I say that. Um, Newman himself never said the Oxford movement was founded for political reasons per se. But again, reading, reading Newman's comments at the time, he's, he's clearly following a political agenda, uh, if, it on, if, if it only in private. Um, now, from an Irish context, the movement was formed to protest against the suppression of the Anglican bishoprics uh, in Catholic Ireland. This protest led Newman 
Newman's attack on the chief advocate of political reform in Ireland, Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator. So this is where they come into blows with one another. Now, who was O'Connell? Well, again, he's a fascinating man. He was first elected for the Westminster Parliament uh, in Clare in 1829, and it was in his intervention that finally compelled the British government to introduce Catholic emancipation. He was elected actually in 1828, but couldn't take his seat because he wouldn't swear the oath of supremacy to the Protestant crown, uh, as he was a Catholic himself. So it was only with Catholic emancipation being introduced uh, the following year, in 1829, he was permitted to take his seat at Westminster. This opened up uh, a whole new era for constitutional politics in relation to Irish nationalism, um, and it's something I discuss further on. Now, Newman confessed in private that he, quote, had a hate for O'Connell and, indeed, the Whig Party. In Newman's eyes, and this is the quote Newman, O'Connell had bullied the politi political establishment to force through Catholic emancipation. Um, Newman condemned the leaders of the Catholic Church for failing equivocally to attack O'Connell, whom he believed was a wicked agitator and a reckless uh, distributor of the peace. So he saw O'Connell as espousing almost violent means uh, and also constitutional methods to achieve his aim of ending Catholic emancipation. Now, again, if anyone under, understands or is aware of Daniel O'Connell, it, it, it would be unfair to describe him as, as a physical force national, a nationalist. He might have eschewed violence or flirted with violence in the 1840s, but he wasn't a wicked agitator, as, 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 as Newman had suggested. Uh, and this comes to the heart of my arguments about Newman and his, the evolution of his thoughts in relation to Irish nationalism. I, I, I argue that Newman's views were incorrect. Um, he failed to realise that O'Connell's occasional public flirtation with the leaders of physical force nationalism was a political tool used by O'Connell in the means of galvanising popular support. The insular nature for Newman, he was at Oxford at this time, uh, was no place for him to gain a grounded understanding of the complexities of Irish politics. It is therefore not surprising that he retained a somewhat false and misleading picture of O'Connell's political activities. Uh, however, Newman's ignorance of Irish politics, and indeed Ireland in general, began to change when he moved to Ireland in 1850. Uh, 51. I should mention actually with O'Connell, why he's so important in terms of Irish history is he had two major platforms which he, which he sought throughout his life to achieve. The first was, um, well the, the second, I'll turn to the second first, was, was Catholic emancipation which he successfully was able to uh, bring through in 1829. The second was repeal of the Union. So in 1801 there was the Act of Union which ended the, the Irish Parliament in Dublin and parliamentarians thereafter had to go to Westminster to be represented in the Parliament. Uh, Connell fought throughout his life to have repeal of the Union, and that's the second part of the paper which I wish, wish to touch on today. It's how Newman viewed uh, relations between Britain and Ireland in the context of the uh, aspirations for, for repeal of the Union. So, as I mentioned, and just for those who aren't aware, uh, in 1851 Newman came to Dublin to set up the Catholic University. Uh, I don't need to go into the ins and outs, but he was he was requested uh, effectively to set up a university, a Catholic university, which would rival the godless colleges which were brought in through uh, the, act, the Act of 1850, Peel's colleges, which were known as the godless colleges in Belfast, Cork, and Trinity College in Galway. The, the idea of setting up a college in Dublin was to espouse theology at the centre of the heart of the university through a Catholic ethos. And it wasn't just to be for students from Ireland, but throughout Europe and indeed further abroad. And it was Newman who was seen, or was hoped, who would carry this mission through. Uh, in Dublin. Unfortunately, as we know, it didn't quite succeed the uh, expectations that he might have had. But it was during his time in Dublin that I argue he, went, he underwent a subtle but significant political shift in his views. Following years of prejudice against O'Connell and the Liberal Catholics, uh, by the time he departed Ireland in 1858, he had established a genuine sympathy towards Irish Catholics' demand for democratic reform. So. He starts to be imbued by the, the arguments of those who were calling for a parliament to be set up in Dublin uh, against what was currently the, the system of uh, parliamentarians travelling from Ireland to be represented at Westminster. Um, so it's during his time in Dublin, travelling throughout Ireland, that he attempts he to, he to understand Irish grievances. Uh, his time spent living and working among the Irish compelled Newman to reassess his entrenched anti-Irish nationalist standpoint as expressed by his revulsion of O'Connell, as I mentioned previously. 
Now, I don't wish to suggest that he openly endorsed Irish demands for democratic reform or political reform, um, but if you read his personal letters and writings at the time, he's, he's, he's aware of the difficulties that Irish people face or face at, the, at, at, at that juncture. Um, so this brings us to Cardinal Cullen, um, extraordinary man. He was born in Ireland but spent most of his early adult life uh, in Rome, where he was trained in Rome, and eventually became a cardinal. Very influential. Uh, he came under the guise of Rome to set up or help establish the Catholic University, and it was he, seen, he saw Newman as being central to his ambitions to set a university up in Dublin. The problem was, as you'll learn, Cullen and Newman fell out with one another almost immediately. Uh, Cullen was from that ultramontane background of um, absolutism in relation to the Pope, Newman opposed that notion, something I'm writing about at the moment, uh, in terms of the conscious. And it, this, this is the beginnings of the end of their relationship. Uh, and it's, it's, it's actually begins, the beginning of the end begins with um, Newman's wi willingness to appoint young Islanders uh, to, the, to the, the staff of the Catholic University. That's what I want to look at next. Um, so it was in the early months of 1855 after the CUI finally opened its doors, so it, it, it hoped it had been, in 1851 the idea of, of establishing Catholic University was, was, was brought forth, but it wasn't until four years later that the university actually opened its doors uh, to, to students. Um, it was then that Newman first showed a willingness to offer a more accommodating uh, attitude towards Irish nationalism. The catalyst for this change was Newman's wish, irrespective of Cullen's protests, uh, to appoint men associated with the radical Young Ireland movement. I'll come back to the Young Islanders in a moment, um, to the staff of the CUI. Writing from Rome in January 1855, Cullen asked Newman not to employ Young Islanders to the staff of the CUI. Quote, I trust you will make every exertion to keep the university free from all Young Islanders, of which the spirit is so evident in the nation. So there's explicit request by Cullen, don't employ Young Islanders. Um, now why would Cullen seem to suggest that the Young Islanders were dangerous? Well, Cullen did not want to appoint Young Irelanders because he saw these men as dangerous revolutionaries. This is an, an image of Young Irelanders fighting uh, and also the famous Thomas Davis, the Davis who led the, the Young Irelanders. <clears throat> Originally, at, at least during the 1830s and 40s, the Young Irelanders had, had espoused pacifist means to secure a repeal of the Union, so to have a parliament in Dublin. The problem was, in the aftermath of the horrors of the, of the Great Famine, 1845 to 51, the Young Irelanders took on a more militant tone and actions, and they actually had a failed uprising in 1848. So only a decade before um, Newman came to Ireland, or five years before, there was a failed uprising led by the Young Irelanders. Hence, why Cullen did not want Newman to appoint these radicals to, to his university staff. To put it into a wider context, the Young Irelanders modelled themselves on the Young Italians, uh, who were led by Massani, who were a revolutionary organisation which, which attacked the papacy, um, and Cullen had experienced them directly during his time in Rome. So it's in this context, Cullen says to Newman, there's no way you're, you're, you're going to appoint these men, we can't trust them. Uh, there's another issue as well about uh, Cullen because of his ultramontane views, was, was opposed to any notions of delayity becoming directly involved in administrative and teaching affairs, and I'll, I'll kind of touch upon that in a moment. <clears throat> so, the failed rebellion of 1848 convinced Cullen that the Young Islander movement was the Irish version of the Young Italians, as I just mentioned. Uh, it's interesting, writing retrospectively in Newman's diary uh, in 1870, he remembered that Cullen had, quote, always compared Young Ireland to Young Italy, and with the most intense expression of the words and consonants, assured me that they will never came right. Never. He knew, he knew this from his experience of Rome. So Newman wrote back, he famously wrote a, a, a Dublin memorandum in 1870 where he recounted all his views about his time in Ireland. Uh, and he was, he was particularly vivid in, in relation to his relations with Cullen. Now, this is great, this is why I, I kind of started to enjoy Newman. Newman said, effectively to Cullen, he put two fingers up and said, I don't care, I'm appointing Young Islanders or Young Ireland sympathisers to the staff of the CUI. This shows that how driven he was. Um, Newman sought to remain neutral and not to become directly involved in Irish political affairs. He considered the political fate of his professors uh, as, quote, and this is coming from Newman, a matter of, of indifference to him, 
since it was no longer likely be to be translated into any form of violent action. So as early as 1851, Newman stipulated to Cullen that as rector, he must have a free hand to appoint staff to the Catholic University. He wanted the best men for the job and did not care what politics certain men followed. Now, as long as the Young Ireland sympathisers uh, kept their politics out of the university, Newman was quite content to employ them. They might make mistakes, but in Newman's own words, it's better to make mistakes than to make nothing. Now, you, can, you know where I'm going with this. Cullen was absolutely incensed by the notion that these Young Islanders were to be employed, and they were employed. Uh, I've looked at Cullen's papers, they're actually in Dublin's Archdiocese, um, and I've spent a considerable time going through them. There's not a huge amount related to Newman, but there is a few letters where um, he, he expresses his, his, um, his, his lack of confidence in Newman. And also, the fact that there isn't a lot of letters to Newman uh, demonstrates that, arguably, well, I, I tried to make the point that for over a year after finding out that he appointed members of the Young Islanders to, to the staff of the COI, Cullen refused to write to Newman, and Newman sent several letters with no replies. Um, which is quite a strange. It was almost that Cullen was having almost a hissy, hissy fit and didn't want to engage with Newman. Um, so I just thought it would be interesting to kind of outline some of those people who were employed, who, who'd, who were members of the Young Islanders or aren't sympathetic to the Young Islanders. I must be careful there. They weren't all Young Island members. Uh, but here's a list of them. Some of, the, some of them might be familiar to you. Eugene O'Curry, um, he was Professor of Archaeology and Irish History an excellent historian, almost a founding father of modern Irish historiography or historical methodologies uh, in Ireland. Um, and Newman got on very well with him and it was through Newman's patriotism that Eugene O'Curry was able to publish two works on Irish history and archaeology. Um, there was John O'Hagan as well who was, who was more radical in his views uh, and was certainly a member of the Young Irelander movement. And then William Kirby Sullivan, Dennis Florent Carty and John Piggott had associations with the movement. Um, it was particularly O'Hagan that, that Cullen was not too happy with, just let's say, uh, in relation to whom were, who were appointed to, to the university. So, as I've mentioned already, it was the employment of these individuals to the staff of the CUI, which was the beginning of Newman's friendly relations, or cordial relations with Cullen. Newman later recorded that one of the reasons for his poor relations with Cullen uh, was the ultimate decision and, and, he, and actually, and one of his reasons for resigning as rector in 1858 be, was because of the Young Islanders. Um, so it became an issue at the beginning, and ultimately it led to his re resignation. Now, to put it into a wider context, at the heart of Newman's newfound sympathy for Irish Catholics was his frustration with the reactionary clergy. He found them very hard to deal with. Um, under C Cullen's influence, which wished to secure control over the Catholic University, Newman did not want, and this is his own words, a priest-ridden institution. Instead, he wished to appoint members of the laity. And this is what's very important about Newman, and this is why he seems, in many respects, as one of the founding fathers of the Second Vatican Council, to bring the laity into the community. Um, that was quite um, against the grain, let's say, at the time, and it, and it caused him problems. Um, the conflict between Cullen and Newman concerning the appointment of members of the, of the lay community was as much as political as educational. Cullen feared that the COI would be a breeding ground for Irish nationalism, a university for revolutionary intellectuals. His prolonged disagreements with Cullen and his frustration with the progress of the COI finally came to a boil in 1858. Uh, in November of that year, he resigned. It's quite a sad end to his, his involvement with the Catholic University. And he never returned to Ireland thereafter. So he died in 1890. Um, after leaving in 1858. But that's not to say, and that's where my paper will conclude this last section, that's not to say he didn't keep an interest in Ireland. And again, if you read his letters from the time, from the 1860s onwards, he always mentions the Catholic University. Uh, he always just wonders how, how is it progressing. Because it did progress. It manifested itself uh, and changed over time. But it, it, it ultimately was a success, but there's a big debate about how, how much of a role Newman played. Um, but he certainly laid the foundation blocks for what was to come in the future. Now, my argument, therefore, as I progress through this paper, is that Newman's years in Ireland marked a transition in his political views towards Irish nationalism and, indeed, the Catholic grievances. 
He later conceded that during his stay in Dublin, he, quote, felt a great interest in the Young Irelander movement. In particular, Newman began to gain an appreciation for Irish nationalists' appeals for legislative independence. So this is where I come to repeat of the Union. Um, Newman's determination to employ laymen to the university, including Young Irelanders, was a defining moment in the evolution of his political thought. After several years in Ireland, Newman returned to England with a real sympathy towards Irish Catholic democratic impulses. So this leads me into the final part of the paper. So Newman's views towards Ireland from the 1860s to his death in 1890, and this is where he, they become radical, um, where I used the subheading rebel originally, and um, that's, that's Newman's own words. So that's where I want to bring the paper to its conclusion and, and all, almost to its evolutionary uh, um, fruition. So this section looks at Newman's relationship with home rule, which is Dominion Parliament in Dublin, and also his views towards Fenianism, which is an aggressive physical force movement uh, in the 1860s and 70s in Ireland. And it's, it's, it's almost a, a, a progression from the Young Irelanders. And he writes about these two movements uh, in his letters uh, during this time. Now, there is a definite indication in Newman's post Dublin writings and his correspondence that he did maintain a keen interest in Ireland, particularly the CUI, as I mentioned. Uh, now, on the subject of Ireland's political conditions, his thoughts turned towards home rule and Fenianism, and he saw them both as intertwined. It's one way of solving Fenianism, the threat of physical force nationalism, was through democratic processes, or through uh, um, the, the granting of some legislative reforms in Ireland. I should be careful when I use the word democratic because, you know, with different connotations uh, at the time, and, and Newman wouldn't have possibly use the word democratic uh, during his lifetime. <coughs> Now, following his departure from Ireland in eight, the late 1850s until his death in 1890, he was very conscious of the responsibility of unjust and oppressive English governments for Irish sufferings. I'll just give you one example. In 1866, he wrote to a friend um, that there was, quote, a burning hatred among Ireland towards the English. So he was aware of this, uh, and this is in the context of, of Fenian, the Fenian uprisings as well. It was the failed Fenian uprising of 1867, uh, which strengthened Newman's conviction. Here's the Fenians, here's a picture of them um, carrying out an assault in Manchester. It was the failed Fenian uprising in 1867 which strengthened Newman's conviction that Westminster needed to grant political concessions to the Irish in order to quell the threat of violence. So again, this rational, realistic kind of idea. Now, the, the Fenians were founded in 1858, and they were a secret brotherhood whose objective was to achieve an Irish nationalist, uh, non-sectarian Ireland by militant means. Uh, and one way, one policy of, of achieving this measure was to was to create terrorism in the streets uh, uh, and cities of, of, of Britain. Um, something I don't want to make the comparison too broadly, but. This, this issue of using Britain as a target to suppress Westminster into, into securing demands is something which the IRA did in the 70s and 80s. So the Fenians were, the IRA took their inspiration from the Fenians in the, uh, 100 years before. <clears throat> now, the Fenian activity, particularly in England, because Newman heard about this, he read about it, um, it shook Westminster out of political apathy towards Irish affairs. They had to do something. Public support wouldn't want to the end to Fenianism. It made people aware of the problems in Ireland. Um, under Liberal Prime Minister William Gladstone, who I'd said Newman maintained really healthy correspondence throughout his life, uh, Gladstone followed through a policy of what we would call pacifying Ireland, appeasing the Irish. Now, this pacifism was brought through by three measures, but the two measures that were initially in his thinking was to grant um, church reform and also land reform. So, just not to go into too much detail, but in 1869, uh, the disestablishment of the Church Act was brought in uh, in Ireland, which no longer effectively made the Anglican Church the, uh, the Supreme Church of Ireland, officially that is. And also in 1870, the following year, uh, Gladstone introduced his first land acts, so like land reform, where Catholic tenants could get access to land. That was, it, was, it created a social revolution over the next 30, 40 years. But, I don't need to go into the details now, but there were two acts or two policies that Newman or Gladstone brought in to pacify Ireland. Now, what's interesting, at this time in the 1860s and 70s, when Gladstone's bringing in his pacification policy uh, of land reform and church reform, Newman is saying that's not enough. You need to bring in political reform. So, 20 years before Gladstone is saying 
uh, or comes to agree with Home Rule, Newman is articulating a Home Rule government for Dublin, which again, it seems quite bizarre. Well, why would Newman, a man who's living an in insular life, okay, at this stage he's, he's in Birmingham, uh, maybe he's been infused by Irish thinkings from the, from the, 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 the famine people who moved across the diaspora. But it is, it's quite a strange process in many respects. Um, so I would argue, as I said, almost two decades before Gladstone, so in the mid 1860s, Newman is articulating some form of legislative reform for Irish nationalists. And I'll give a few examples now. Um, what, what he was effectively advocating was the transfer of power from Westminster to an internal federal government in Dublin, where politicians in Ireland would have control of internal affairs, but the kind of grander scheme of foreign policy would stay with Westminster. So it wasn't radical. He wasn't saying for a separate parliament. Um, he was effectively calling for what the Irish were actually achieved in 1920, 21, uh, under the terms of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Um, but it was, it was quite peculiar for a man from his background to be advocating such policies. Um, so why, why, why is this? Well, I argue that it's, Newman was practical, practical, realistic, and knew that social change and church change was not enough to, to quell the demands of Irish nationalists. He, he understood what the demands were. Uh, and that's not to say he, he uh, supported them, but he certainly sympathised them. And that's where the paper will finish now. Um, in a letter dated January 1866, Newman debated the merits of an Irish securing a le greater legislative control at local level and possibly of granting of home rule. And this is 1866, this is 20 years before Gladstone. Um, for example, Newman, during, in 1866, in the letter I mentioned, he questioned why Ireland, if requested by her people, was not entitled to acquire its own legislator, legislator for domestic purposes. Quote, if Ireland were left to the Irish, he said, Quote, perhaps it would buy off repeal. So he's thinking already, you know, I've listened to what has happened before. This might work. Thus, although he rejected Irish demands for repeal of the Union and the creation of an independent separate parliament in Dublin, uh, he did accept the principle that home rule was necessary um, as a way of, of, of curtailing the threat of Fenianism. And this leads me in to just finish up on Fenianism, because it's some fascinating letters that Newman writes to our, towards the end of his lifetime. Um, and an indication of his well-hidden, well-hidden, but apparent admiration in principle, if not practice, for Irish nationalist agitation. In October of 1881, Newman privately wrote that far from being, quote, cowards, Irish Catholics protests against new land lord, laws made them, quote, patriots. This is Newman speaking. Seven years later, in 1887, writing to the anti-Irish nationalist Gerard Manley Hopkins, Newman clearly expressed what he would have felt if he had been an Irish nationalist under the suppression of the British government. This is the quote Newman. Irish, uh, Irish patriots hold that they have never yielded themselves to the sway of England, and therefore never have been under their laws, and never have been rebels. He concluded, quote, if I were an Irishman, I should be, in heart, a rebel. So Newman's attitude towards Irish nationalism in his post dublin years indicate more arguably of a political liberalism. His acknowledgement that Irish MPs should win political concessions for Westminster, together with his sympathy in principle, if not practice, and that's very stressed, I must stress that, um, for physical force nationalism was a marked departure from his Tory inclinations of the 1830s and his opposition to Robert Peel granting of um, Catholic emancipation. Um, he called Peel, who was the Home Secretary, actually a rat for bringing in Catholic emancipation. Um, now, however, Newman's opposition to the emergence of democratic impulses do not remain, did not remain impervious. His willingness to discuss the merits of Home Rule were very similar in tone to Gladstone. This is where you could see the liberal connotations or inclinations. Um, but that's not to say, I don't wish to suggest he was a liberal, no way, because there's some other examples where he was conservative. What Newman did, he changed, he was, he was rational, he made decisions based on particular circumstances. He wasn't set to one agenda. Um, so just to conclude, that's a famous picture of Homer, well actually a symbol. Uh, Newman's early years as a member of the Anglican Church, before his conversion to Roman Catholicism in 1845, were tainted by a bitter dislike of Irish Catholics' appeals for political reform, which I've hopefully demonstrated. This anti-Catholic mindset was personified by Newman through his opposition to Daniel O'Connell. 
However, upon departing Ireland in 1858, Newman's attitude, I would argue, has certainly changed. His seven years in Ireland accelerated a slow but definite change in his political views towards Irish nationalism. His close association with Ireland compelled him to comprehend Irish Catholics' palpable sense of injustice at the hands of the Westminster Parliament. So while in Dublin he slowly disregarded his pre previous prejudices uh, and came to understand Irish grievances. And lastly, Newman's post-Dublin year, years marked the culmination of his political conversion. During these years, he articulated a genuine sympathy for Irish nationalist appeals for political reform and a definite understanding of the physical force tradition in Ireland. While certainly not an advocate of Ireland's exit from the Union, he did acknowledge that Ireland should secure greater legislative independence from Great Britain. Thank you. And as a I just want also acknowledge if anyone's interested in reading more on the topic of Irish nationalism and Newman's political or social views, there's a couple of copies of my work in the library. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I, it's so nice to see the Newman I recognise again, because I know him as a rebel. Um, in fact, my my default thesis was very much about um, Newman as a rebel when he was at Oxford and actually using um, force in some circumstances to take over the Sheldonian theatre when Pusey was declared uh, heretical in one of his uh, sermons. So there's a whole prehistory to this Newman which I recognise. And that's why I think the Newman in Context series is such a nice idea because it brings together the many different Newmans that we all know or work on in our own research and we see, hopefully, um, get a sense of the, the man himself and all the different contexts he fits into. So I have quite a few questions, but I can ask you them afterwards if we okay. run out of time. But does anyone have any... Oh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you again. If we could thank Stephen, first thank of all, for, for talking. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Yes. Uh, on the link between theological and political perspectives, Sorry. On the link between theological and political perspectives, I heard you were suggesting that earlier in life he was conservative in both, and uh, politically then relaxing, uh, his political perspective uh, being moderated. Um, but did he not become a theological rebel as well? So that the two go together. No, I, I actually no, I, 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 yeah, I agree with you absolutely. That he did. Um, are you talking after his conversion to Roman Catholicism, or just generally in his, the Oxford movement? Well, it, well, the paper I'm working on at the moment in relation to papal infallibility, he seems quite a radical there in that respect. So, yeah, I don't. I didn't mean to suggest that he's, he's a, a conservative in a small C throughout his life and, and his theological pursuits. Um, but I suppose I was just trying to juxtapose it in relation to his political views. But yeah, I, I, I take on board your comment. Thank you, Stephen. I, I wouldn't want to disagree with anything you said. Just to add a comment. Um, at the beginning, you located Newman in relation to Ireland in his instinctive desire to defend the, right, the rights of the Anglican Church. And as he became a Catholic and found himself pretty isolated in the Catholic Church, and he, he was so typically English that he didn't fit the Roman mold. Um, and and as, in his, as he got older, the Roman Catholic Church was going through its most conservative and centralizing period in history. Um, with, without one, I, I'm not sure whether the word rebel in, in Catholic or radical quite fits his place in Catholicism, but he became very suspicious of the high handedness of church authorities in dealing with what they thought were the enemies of the church. He saw, he saw this in Italy. He saw it at Vatican I, and he didn't want to go as far as um, s some of the people who clearly decided this is the end of the road. But 
he didn't he didn't like the high handedness of the bishops or of Rome, um, and I think this is just another aspect. Of, I mean, it was his sympathy for the working poor. It was his first hand contact. It was his direct experience of high handed bishops who wouldn't let him. Yeah, as you use the phrase, I don't want a priest-ridden university. Um, and he said, if only they'd leave me alone to make the appointments and all that kind of thing and back off. So I, I think part of his sympathy for political developments was realising that the church's instinctive hostility to, to modernity was likely to be counterproductive. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Uh, I, I suppose I was just looking through the pr prism of Irish, the Irish situation. I keep coming back to the paper of availability, but he, he, and I know you've read his own letters during this time. He, he, he wasn't sure if he would, if he would agree with paper of availability in public, and eventually he did. And um, so he was grappling with these notions. But so yeah, the, the term radical has been used now more wider than I, I imagine myself. Um, but it, I take on board your comments. Thanks. I was really um, interested in, um, you know, his um, his own interest in appointing young islanders to the CUI. Um, I really saw there the man I knew, or feel like I knew, in his Oxford days when he was tutor at Oriel, and he um, tried to get quite a few of his Tractarian friends appointed as uh, tutors and, and colleagues and protégés. Um, in the same way that the Noetics, with whom they had something of a theological disagreement. Um, also tried under Copleston and various other um, university leaders, um, sort of actual factional appointments, if you like, within the university. Um, I'm really sure his Anglican past prepared him or helped him in that stance that he took when he went to um, Catholic University in Ireland as rector. Um, there's usually seen as this caesura in his career, you know, his conversion, but I see so much more continuity between the, the two Newmans, if, if I wouldn't even describe it as two Newmans, it's the same man. Um, and he really was a terrible rebel when he was at university. He wrote really um, sometimes quite obscene journalism, critical of university authorities. I can prove this if it's being recorded. <laughs> um, not obscene, in a, in a, but in a political sense. You know, he talks about wanting to rebel against authority, to destroy authority, to unseat power. Um, and I think his sympathies later on do really reflect. People often say he ceased to be just adolescent sort of, you know, troubles. But I think it remained a consistent feature of his character. And you've just shown me that that, that carried through into his Catholic mm. period as well, which I, I wasn't aware of in so much detail. So thank you. I just wondered if... The, well, I wasn't... I, I touched upon it in the readings, but I, I never considered it and the rebellious nature of Newman at Oxford. Mm. So I've got the, indeed, he's involved with the Oxford movement, was radical in itself. But yes. in terms of trying to appoint friends and colleagues to physicians, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, in many ways, it was a radical youth movement. Yeah. I mean, it was a very young movement. Um, um, and they could get violent themselves in several circumstances. Yeah. And the vice-chancellor had to discipline and um, rusticated several of them for violence in the Sheldonian Theatre right. in Newman's name in the 18, late 1830s, early 1840s. Mm. I was thinking about Newman and his political stance, like when he went on his travels and he was very unwell, I think it was the late 1920s, 30s, he, he famously went and seen the French tricolour and he was disgusted at this notion of liberty, eternity, uh, equality, fraternity and this notion of democracy and it just placed him in the context of seeing the Irish tricolour flying uh, in the 1870s or 80s and see how, how he, he worked through all these various prejudices. But I, I suppose the point we're trying to make here, and it, it builds into the lecture, so it's the context, it's Newman, the wider person, mm. and how we can relate our works into understanding him more generally. Um, because we don't want to be subject specific, or, or no. we want to just understand the man as a, as a bigger entity. And actually, I was just thinking, it was Roy Foster actually, only recently, um, I don't, it wasn't here, I'm sure he didn't read my work, but he's, he's referred to Newman as an armchair Republican. Okay. And that's the prominent scholar in Oxford. Um, but that's another, that's another issue. Any other questions? It's just, um, hi, thanks for that, Stephen. Um, it's just from my readings into Newman and education, and there was, I, remember, I was trying to remember, it was a Kerr or Cullen, I think it, it was a commentary upon that he was actually doomed to fail, 
that when he was elected, or sorry, selected to set up the CUI, that it was some sort of political kind of, how would you say, don't, kind of maybe conspiracy in a sense that he was actually used. And I was just wondering, is was that the case, and was he aware of that, and that arose his kind of, and my second point is, or my uh, second question is, in the terms of education, and his approach to education, or his views, and it's kind of reflective on his views. He was in the, in the middle, always kind of on the fence. And, but from a, like an educational perspective, in my my view, it was an important position between kind of t preserving the tradition and this, as uh, Professor Sullivan said, this kind of idea of modernity and progression. And he was able to kind of balance, I suppose, the two. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you have any comments on that and that kind of mindset in terms of. I'll his politics. I'll maybe touch upon the f second question first, and then I might let John answer the first question because he's, 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 that's his area per, uh, per se. But I'll, I'll, the first question, John gave a brilliant paper a few weeks ago on the, kind of the idea of knowledge, the circle of knowledge, and we spoke about how Newman imbued what he thought was, was important from the past, but also then could modernise. And in terms of the modernisation aspects, I touched upon it with Eugene O'Curry, who was Professor of Archaeology, his notion of he did encourage research. He did encourage specialism to set up the Atlantis Journal. Um, and that's something I think sometimes people forget and they almost say, well, that's, that's, Newman wouldn't have embraced that idea, but he certainly did. Newman was one of the first, or the Catholic University was one of the first institutions in the British Isles to have evening classes. So people, he said people could go work during the day and come to classes in the evening. That was quite forward thinking for his time. He set up a department, or helped set up a department of poetry. Again, that was quite, uh, within the wider context, it was quite new. Um, and so I'd say he did look forward, and he did, he did upset people, and I mentioned, John mentioned this as well a few weeks ago, that you know, he said it was important that you had tutorial systems, that students live close to the university, and that upset Cullen, like Newman played pool with, with, with students or snooker or billiards as it was then, um, and again that infuriated Cullen, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you know, in such an, in a close position with your students, where we know today, I think that's a great aspect of hope that we do work together in kind of a small environment. But the, set, the first question um, was: Was Newman set up? I suppose, John, <laughs> would you mind? Um, no, he wasn't. I don't. I don't think he was set up, but he was. He was doomed to fail in that he was given a poison chalice. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that was deliberate. I think the, the bishops were dysfunctional um, and, and they've proven that they remain, they've remained so yeah. well over a century later. Um, the, the only comment I would make is that title of your book I think is spot on. I, th I think for all this openness that he, that he, and his evolution, he was a conservative at heart. He did believe in tradition. He thought it, um, it needed to be upheld and revisited, but it wasn't closed. No. It was an open conservatism. And, I mean, Christians believe, and, this was, and Newman wrote about this, that through our baptism we are priests, prophets, and kings. Now, what is known about Newman is that he was a very spiritual person, and his sermons were famous, and young people flocked to hear him though it wasn't particularly charismatic style, reading a long text. But what they know less of, and you've helped uh, broaden this picture, is that the prophetic side, speaking truth to power when he was young, middle-aged and old, made him an awkward customer for yeah. those in authority. And what you've also briefly mentioned a few moments ago <laughs> is that when it came to being in leadership, he paid attention to the nitty-gritty, yeah. the practical. You know, he, did, he did try a number of things. He wasn't just a theorist. You know, he, um, but what you've brought out today is the prophetic side. He was prepared, both young and old. When, when his conscience told him, he did have a highly active conscience, um, to speak truth to power. And those in power do not like truth being spoken to them. Absolutely not. Um, that, one last point um, I'm just thinking to myself is we talk about today the market, we're in the market, and student numbers, if you don't have the student numbers, the university can't exist. Well, unfortunately, the Catholic University never had the student numbers, and that's one of the reasons as well why, why it failed. Because the idea was to bring in European Catholics to Dublin, 
but Dublin wasn't an attractive city in many respects at the time, and, and it was never fulfilled, that ambition. Um, but the social infrastructure in Ireland, the number of people who were qualified, was just, just too small, just too small yeah. at the time to make viable mass. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks. Who have we got next, actually? Do you know? Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering. <laughs> <laughs>